on Facebook. The talk today is about the intimate link about yoga and veganism. Now, I'm going to caveat this by saying that this is my interpretation of yoga, okay? So this isn't, you know, something that is uh, written down somewhere. Um, like most sacred texts for all religions and practices, it's based on man-made interpretations. Um, so really, it's me relaying to you um, how I view, view yoga and how I practice it myself. Um, I might add, though, that this is a growing held belief amongst more and more people. So this isn't just me saying this, but there are so many more people. There's a wide movement now of people who practice yoga who also believe that there is an intimate link between yoga and veganism. Um, and hopefully today, after I've uh, shared with you my thoughts and you've seen some of the illustrations, uh, you'll be suitably convinced as well. Okay. Um, has anybody here actually, um, are, you, are you all activists, first and foremost? Yeah. So you're all animal rights activists, okay? So the one thing I will again say is when I normally do this talk, um, I do it to generally people who are non-activists, non uh, perhaps they're vegan, perhaps they're not. Um, it's not, you know, sort of constructed and construed for the activist. But what I have done is I've actually got the main presentation which I do for non-activists, for non-vegans. So you'll see um, what I basically say and use to convince and to persuade people to consider veganism through the eyes of yoga, okay? Um, and perhaps you can sort of borrow bits from that as well, perhaps when you're doing activism and you're talking to people um, and you might come across um, Hindu people, Buddhists, Jains, uh, those who even practice yoga and you can perhaps utilize some of this information and persuade them even further as to why veganism is the only way. Yeah? Great, okay. Um, who here then actually practices practices yoga? Okay. One person, yeah? So if I may ask, and, and this is to everyone, it's not just to you who practices yoga, but when you hear the term yoga, what what comes to your mind? Flexibility, bending like a pretzel. <laughs> yeah. What else? What else comes to your mind? Meditating. Meditating. Okay. Good. Yeah. What else? Anything else? How about the lady that put her hand up who practices yoga? What does yoga mean to you? Um. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. You don't have to answer. No, it's absolutely fine. Um, for me, it's kind of combining exercise with mindfulness. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and like Mark said, flexibility. Yeah, I've been doing it for years and I absolutely love it. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like the, 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 the Sanskrit word yog, where yoga is derived from, actually means connectedness, to connect. And that is to connect the mind with the body with the spirit. So it's sort of, um, as opposed to yoga being a physical exercise, it's actually a practice, it's a way of life. I suppose one way we can look at that is think of veganism. For us all, um, and, and, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but veganism is a way of life. We don't just limit veganism to the foods that we eat, but it's to the clothes that we wear, to the products that we buy, to perhaps the transport and the methods that we use. It extends, and yoga is very much like this. It's, it's all encapsulating, and it applies to every single aspect of one's life. Okay, and again, I'll, I'll show you briefly what I mean by this. Um, in fact, my yoga teacher, when I did uh, yoga, am I okay standing here, by the way? I know I've got my back to you. Um, when I did my yoga uh, teacher training in India, my yoga teacher said to me, and I, I wrote his words down, and he actually said to me, um, you know, yoga isn't about sort of finding strength, flexibility, and peace on the mat. It's about, finding, um, it, it's about finding inner strength when you're faced with adversity, or it's finding peace when your mind is in chaos, and it's finding flexibility when you're rigid in your thoughts. So of course we practice yoga on the mat, but everything we gain from that practice we then apply to the rest of our lives. And for me, veganism is one of those. So, moving on. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Now, Patanjali um, was, I suppose you could say, one of the uh, godfathers, the godfather of yoga. Yoga's been around for thousands of years. I'm not here to convince you as to where yoga comes from, um, but one of the most leading 
practices um, or, or texts and scriptures is the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, where uh, Patanjali talks about sort of the eight steps to freedom, okay, which are also known as the eight limbs of, of, of yoga. Um, I'm going to be just simply focusing on uh, the first limb. So in that first um, circle that you see, it says Yamma. I'm going to be simply focusing on Yamma today, because otherwise we'd be here all day if I was going to go through all of those different eight limbs. Um, so I'm just going to be focusing on Yamma. Now Yamma has five sublimbs, and I'm going to take you through those five sublimbs throughout the course of the next 20 minutes, half an hour. But just for the sake of completeness, I'm just going to uh, explain to you briefly what the other seven limbs mean as well, just so you've got a bit more of a complete picture. Okay? So Yama, which I'll go through, is basically a set of, um, I suppose you'd say, ideals um, of, of how to live, and Patanjali talked um, very much about these sort of ideals. If you apply these ideals to your life, you will live um, a more, more sort of peaceful, contented life. Then you've got niyama, which sort of means um, sort of self-discipline, uh, self-discovery. Uh, uh, you do that through, uh, I think some, you mentioned meditation as well, mindfulness. Um, it also it, it, it includes things like routine. So, you know, having, having a, a good routine in your life, cleansliness, um, uh, contentment can be brought about with a, a routine that brings you peace and joy um, and groundedness. Then you've got asana. Now, asana is the physical practice. So for most of us in the West, when we think of yoga, we think, as, as you said, um, Mark, you said flexibility, right? So flexibility, bending like a pretzel. And a lot of people actually get put off by yoga because they think, well, I, I can't even touch my toes. But if you see just from those eight limbs, asana, the physical practice, is simply one part of yoga. And we in the West, I was one of these as well, I hold my hand up, was so convinced that yoga was all about the physical practice. So many schools of yoga in the West teach you all about how to um, get through the endurance of yoga, how to get through a hot and sweaty one and a half hour class and, and the flexibility and how great you feel, the physical part of it. It's seen as an exercise, it's seen as, as, as training for a marathon. But as you can see, the actual construct of yoga and what it means to practice yoga the physical part is one part and in fact if you go to the, the east if you go to india and if you go to speak to some of these teachers in india they put very little focus on the asana practice very little focus literally one eighth of a focus as it should be because all the other um sections are just as important as the physical practice okay moving on to the fourth one Pranayama, breath control. Breath control, very important. We don't utilize our lungs how we are supposed to. We only, we only utilize a small aspect of our lungs. And Pranayama teaches you various breathing techniques that can actually cure you of certain ailments um, and diseases. Then you've got um, Pratihara, which is, I think, this certainly applies to me, and perhaps it might apply to you, might resonate with it, but it's withdrawing from outside stimuli. So turning the phone off, turning the television off, getting off Facebook, getting off Instagram, all those things, blocking out outside stimuli, really important. Again, another important part of, of yoga. Then you've got dharana, uh, which is concentration. So one of the things that links heavily to asana, which is the physical practice, is can you be in a posture comfortably and concentrate and focus on your breathing? If a posture is causing you to ache, if it's causing you to be in discomfort, then that's not yoga. That's not yoga. You're supposed to be able to hold that posture for a period of time and be able to concentrate during that period of time. Again, in the West, I'm not knocking the West, but it's just how we, I think, apply and utilize um, exercise in the way we want it to benefit us very quickly, very quickly, we want to see results very quickly. And yoga is all about sort of applying it in your everyday life, so you're not just trying to reach an end goal. Then you've got um, dhyana, which is um, I I immense focus, so being mindful about everyday activity, simple things, pouring a cup of tea to washing up, being in the present moment. 
And then ultimately, if my interpretation serves me correct, what Patanjali is trying to say is if we practice all seven of those uh, limbs well, if we apply them to our lives, we ought to reach the state of samadhi, which is the state of ultimate liberation. Now that's not when you die or, or when you, you know, cross the bridge or pass over, it's actually reaching a state of pure contentment and bliss and being able to be in the present moment now with whatever circumstances you're facing. And I think for us as activists, when we're out doing activism or we might be seeing a video with an animal um, being called suffering, that can cause a lot of uh, discomfort for us. You know, and we can feel very helpless and we can feel like we want to do more and we can feel anger and rage. And, you know, one thing that yoga can teach us is that whatever is happening out there, maintain that sense of stillness within. And when you can maintain that sense of stillness within, you can actually do a lot more for the, the, the causes that you want to be involved in. Okay? So, moving on then. Like I said, I'm going to just focus on Yamma, which is the first... The first limb. I'm actually going to sit here now because I'm going to have to press this um, key a few times, and I've got this little uh, little boy hanging off me. Um, so the first limb of Yamma is the himsa. Who has heard of a himsa? Just by show of hands. Okay. So for those of you who have heard of a himsa, can you just perhaps tell me what a himsa means to you? Practicing non-violence. Non-violence. We're all activists, right? I mean, one of the most uh, important tenets of animal rights activism is that we believe in non-violence, whether it be to an animal or another human being or to the planet, correct? Ahimsa is one of the most important first sublims of Yamma. It means non-violence, absolutely. So when I'm actually talking to uh, non-vegans who are perhaps interested in yoga or perhaps who um, are interested in veganism, and they eat meat, consume animal flesh, or they perhaps are vegetarians and consume dairy, I ask them, does that look like a himsa to you? Right? Now, it's a rhetorical question for you folk, because we're all in the same boat. But that, to me, when I think of yoga and a himsa, that doesn't look like a himsa. That certainly doesn't look like a himsa to me. Cutting up dead bodies and then gorging on their flesh. <laughs> So the question I put to people is, well, if you're interested in yoga and if you're interested in the practice of it, what about the rest of it? What about applying it to the rest of, the rest of your life? And the most important thing is, of course, the foods that we eat. In fact, Will Tuttle, um, he wrote The World Peace Diet. Has anybody read The World Peace Diet? Great, great man. And I really recommend actually looking him up. On, um, on the internet, he actually uh, said that our daily lives are filled with choices on how we nourish ourselves. And most of us, we are blessed that we, we can make this choice at least three times a day, correct? So how do we want to make that choice? Do we want to make that choice that contributes to the suffering of another being? Or do we want to make that choice where actually, you know, no other being had to die for the food that we're eating, especially when we can be abundantly healthy without it? So that's something that I question, and one thing that if you're faced with a, and I say this especially because Hindus, Hinduism, the tenet of Hinduism, the core concept of Hinduism is compassion and ahimsa. So if you're talking to Hindus out there on the street, you know, you can talk about ahimsa, and you can talk about the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, because most Hindus will be aware of what yoga means. A lot of Hindus will be aware that yoga is more than the physical practice. And you can bring up this subject of ahimsa. Well, what are your thoughts on ahimsa? What does it mean to you? Yeah? So moving on then, the second sublim um, that I want to talk about is uh, satya. Satya actually means truthfulness. Yeah? Truthfulness. Now, within the animal agricultural industry, how much are we all lied to by animal, um, animal uh, agriculture, the advertising that they put out? We're lied to endlessly, are we not? I mean, just think of the Happy Egg Company, right? I mean, I don't need to go into the blatant lies that the Happy Egg con uh, Company are, are actually trying to hide. What about milk, you know? Milk is what's supposed to be good for us. 
is it? And yet, you know, there are studies that show that it can cause osteoporosis, and in some countries where they consume the most milk, have the highest rates of osteoporosis. What about, um, you know, some of the proteins found in, he's trying to put himself to sleep here. Um, what about some of the proteins found in the milk causing cancers? So all these things that the animal agricultural industry, the dairy industry, try to hide from us. The KFC ad, this was what, last year or two years ago, where they said we use the whole chicken and they have these like pictures of the, 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 the chickens that they use. And look how healthy, look how healthy these chickens look in their adverts, right? And yet we've got animal equality and Viva, who have recently been and, you know, gone down to chicken farms and taken photos of the realities of what these chickens actually are, are going through. Now these are the realities of the animal agriculture industry. So again, Sathya, to practice yoga, if we are meant to live a state of truthfulness, how can we then be gorging on the lies when these industries are relying on our consumption to feed their profit, right? So if we make a different demand, if we say, well, I'm not going to feed into your lies, literally, and we start demanding a different product, what are they going to do? Supply a different product. It's simple economics, is it not? Supply and demand. We, you know, when people say to me in activism, go to the government, it's the government's fault, you know? There's a lot of retractions, pushing away. Go to the government, why don't you appeal to the legislators? It's like, well, hold on a second. These farmers, these companies, they just want to make a profit. Right? They just want to make a profit. So if we start demanding a different product and they need to make a profit from that, they're going to provide that. Simple economics. Just a few more pictures that I actually got from um, the last beaver and animal equality investigation, which I've got for you there. Again, you know, they show cows grazing in fields, the calf is next to the cow. I mean, that's all. That's all rubbish. This is the reality. Cows grazing in their own urine and feces. Udders full, you know, often full of, um, of, of infection, close to having mastitis, weakened from the constant impregnation and lactation, having their babies taken away. That's the reality. In fact, you know, of course, as we know, there was a successful um, vegan world advert where the advertising agency, the dairy industry, challenged the advert and said this is a lie. And the advertising in, um, agency got involved, had to check, is this a lie, humane milk, is it a miss? Is, you know, does the dairy industry take babies and the milk, etc., etc. And the advertising agency, which has nothing to do with veganism, actually said, no, that's not a lie, that, that advert's okay, that's the truth. So if the advertising agency is actually saying that what we are saying in our activism as vegans is correct. What more do you need, right? So again, you know, more, more leverage for us to convince people out there who perhaps are interested in yoga um, that, you know, well, let, let's apply the truthfulness to every aspect of our life. Let's not cherry pick, right? It's one thing that really, really gets me is don't cherry pick. If you're going to do it, embrace it fully. Don't say, well, I'll do a bit of that. I'll try to do the headstand, but I'll eat my steak tonight. Yeah, don't make a mockery out of yoga, right? Because that's not what yoga is. Okay, the third sublim, asteya. Asteya is all about not stealing, not taking what isn't ours. Another ideal, Patanjali taught us, you know, don't take what isn't yours. Don't take what doesn't belong to you, right? Not stealing, but these are ideals that we're all taught probably by our parents, our caregivers when we were little, right? This isn't unusual to us. When we were children, we were taught, don't take what isn't yours, don't steal. So this is kind of common sense. Let's look at the reality then. Wool. Whose wool is that? Who's the, who, you know, who does it belong to? Certainly not us. And many might say, well, you know, well, sheep, you know, naturally produce wool and that's what they do and they don't get hurt in the process. Well, actually, no, we've selectively 
bred sheep to produce extra skin to therefore produce more wool for the wool industry. It's not like us shaving our legs. You know, these, these industries, they've got demands, time pressures, they've got quotas to meet. So the way they shear these animals, they often get hurt in the process. In fact, I didn't know about this, um, but I, I read that there is a practice, and you might know more, but there's a practice where they, um, they, they actually uh, take off a flesh of the uh, hind part of their body uh, to, to make sure that when the, uh, the, the sheep are out, if the flies are going to go anywhere, they're going to go to that part of the, 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 the body so they don't actually then infest the wool, the rest of the wool. And it's, um, it's actually to, to um, uh, prevent, uh, it's called fly strike, and it's to prevent fly strike. It's where basically flies will start infesting in the wool and that, then the wool becomes useless. So what they do is they actually cut out a piece of the, piece of the, 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 the back of the body. Um, so maybe need the, the leg, just cut a bit of flesh. So the flies go to that part of the body, and uh, not the rest of the wall. So, you know, these, these practices are, are commonly known. Um, cow's milk, yeah? Again, cow's milk, whose milk are we stealing? You know, whose milk are we stealing? And once they have given us enough milk, and they can't give us any more milk, they can't give us any more babies, we send them to the slaughterhouse. And then we don't leave them alone there either. We take their skin. So again, if we want to practice Australia, let's not take what isn't ours. And then you've got the fourth sublim, Brahmacharya, which is not misusing sexuality. Okay, so this isn't saying, you know, don't have sex with more than one person. It's not saying that. It's just saying don't exploit or misuse sexuality. What are we doing in the animal agricultural industry? We're misusing, we're abusing every female animal that there is. We've got artificial insemination. We all know about artificial, artificial insemination. By the way, this is an educative video that I've got here, uh, which is from a farmer, um, and it's teaching another farmer how to artificially inseminate. Do you want me to play it? It's about three minutes long. I can miss it if you don't want me to play it. It's entirely your call. Obviously, I show it to you know, other audiences, but you're all activists and you're all vegans, so it's entirely your call. Yeah. Fine, fine, fine. That's why, yeah, because I'd rather just give the choice, absolutely. Um, so, you know, you've got artificial insemination. You know, we're taking, again, what isn't, what isn't ours, but also we're sexually exploiting these animals as well, exploiting their reproductive tracts. Then you've got the... Um, the fifth sublim, aprigaha. Now this means living within your means. Now let's look at living within your means. About 7 billion people in this world and yet we're killing over 56 billion land farmed animals. Yeah, how is that living within our means? And again, if we look at the resources that we use just to actually um, produce meat, land re use, uh, re uh, resources, deforestation, water, um, in fact, a study that I read, an average American diet of beef consumption creates 1,984 pounds of CO2 emissions annually. Replacing beef with plants reduces that figure 96%, bringing it down to 73 pounds of CO2. And of course, with the climate crisis where it's at, you all know that you know, animal agriculture is the second largest contributor to uh, CO2 um, and... and um, uh, poisonous gas emissions. So, you know, I, I, I don't need to labour this point, but again, if we're living within our means and if we're practising yoga, then what about also this limb, Aprigraha? Living within our means. Right? So what I often say to, um, to people when I'm doing this talk, particularly non-vegans, is look, you've got the earth, and again, one more thing that you can... You can often say or um, uh, ask Hindus about is, of course, you're, are you all familiar that Hindus see the cow as a mother, right? But we also see we also see the earth as a mother as well. Okay, we actually see the earth as our mother. So what are we doing to help sustain our mother, the earth? It's no point preaching all of this about the cow is our mother and the earth is our mother. What, how am I practicing that? What am I doing every day? 
what, what's the easiest way that I can actually help the earth? Go vegan. Simplest, simplest way. That's where I actually say yoga and veganism is linked. Because if yoga is all about bringing liberation of mind and contentment, how can we do that for ourselves where we're actually contributing to the confinement of, of other animals? How can we uh, feel peace where we're contributing to the separa separation of a mother from her baby? We can't feel those things ourselves through the practice on our mat if through our daily choices we're contributing to the suffering of other beings. It's actually, um, it's such common sense that I think it's missed. That's how, how logical this is, right? With just a few, uh, obviously I use these photos to ignite some, um, you know, some sense of uh, conscious um, movement. So what I often say to people is that, look, yoga and veganism, absolutely linked. I've only just gone through the first, the first limb of Yama. If I actually went through all the other limbs and you link that to the animal agriculture industry, there's going to be even more information. Um, and in fact, there's a beautiful, beautiful mantra which I'll leave you with. Um, which actually actually means, um, and, and you know, often in yoga, this is this is this is chanted, and it means may all beings be free, may all beings be happy. And in Sanskrit, there is no word for human beings; it's just beings, which already tells you that those who truly know about yoga, those who practice yoga, and if you speak to Hindus as well. The only word is beings, which encompasses all beings, not just humans.